I told you before, okay? You got your game, and I got mine, okay? I got ten of the finest whores in the world working for me, and I'm getting a hundred dollars a day from each one, okay? Goldie, get off my ass with the penny, any pussy schemes. The people with the funny hats and the noisemakers, they've gone home, Goldie. The party's over, baby. It's dawn. It's reality. We shouldn't show pimps to white America that this is who we are in our community. They'll think we're all like this. And that was the problem of storytelling because everyone would generalize one black man on TV and on the news, all black people are like that. You know, so that was a part of a lot of the dialogue. And oh my God, you know, can we do other films? Yeah, but no one will come and see them, you know, so. So you like the music, you like the fashions, you like the culture, you like this and you like that. Okay, well, that, those are also the stereotypes, too. Somebody's a junkie, somebody's a pimp, has to be involved with that crime, has to be involved in the ghetto. The white cops are all evil. So now, put into a social fabric framework, oh, what, all we are are pimps, all we are are cops, all we are are detectives, all we are are pushers or bounty hunters or these kind of things. No, but at the same time, it's crime cinema. So the only real argument coming from the other side is like, you know, black shouldn't be doing crime films. <laughs> I think, frankly, the white directors are going to, going to step in and, and take over the bonanza. Uh, black directors are continually beaten over the head for doing what they call uh, black film. I was making old Warner Brothers gangster movies uh, like uh, Public Enemy and, uh, and Little Caesar and just putting black actors into it. Larry Cohen's one of the underappreciated, mo oh, near geniuses of, of American filmmaking. A man who is always socially and politically conscious and comes up with kind of low down but ingenious ways of expressing political issues and problems. After I had done a picture called Bone with Yafit Kodo, I was summoned to Sam Arkoff's office. He said, we want to make some uh, black attractions, and uh, you really know how to direct those black actors. I said, well, Sam, there's only one black actor in the picture, Yafid Koto, and I agree he was good, but directing a black actor is no different than directing anybody else. But uh, I said, as long as you're interested, I have to have something in the trunk of the car you might like to read. And we ran down and got the treatment for Black Caesar. Well, we weren't out of the office before we had a deal. <laughs> A man who grew up with nothing and clawed his way up to the top is trying to live in the white man's world, playing by the white man's rules, and forgets his true identity and is basically brought down by the fact that he doesn't know himself. It's a classic tragic story. Jesus Christ! Sauce looked like it needed a little more meat. What the hell are you doing? Who are you? Just a jig who heard Grossville needed killing. There were a number of these action-adventure films which started to liberate the black image and, and started to bring out this kind of physical black macho, this expression of black violence. We were tired of seeing the, the righteous black man. And all of a sudden, we had guys who were us, or guys who did the things we wanted those guys to do. We wanted the guys, kill the man, don't talk to him, don't... Think of some elaborate scheme, you know, I'm going to leave you here and I'm going to let the dogs eat you. No, shoot him and get on with your life, you know. And guys like Fred Williamson and Jim Brown and, and Ron O'Neill and all these guys did that stuff. Jim Kelly, Jim Brown, uh, Fred Williamson, all these black athletes were getting into action adventure and, and being black heroes. My nickname when I played professional football was The Hammer. I wanted to do a black gangster movie, and I wanted to be like Edward G. Robinson, where you rob from the rich and give to the poor. 
casting is 75% of directing. Fred was beautiful. Let's face it, he was gorgeous. With Fred Williamson, you could say he was the black Burt Reynolds. Look at me. I can walk down any street, in any part of any city, in any ghetto, wherever it's rough, wherever it's tough. I walk by three or four guys, man, and as I walk by them, they go, hey, that's the hammer, man. Yeah, yeah, you're a bad dude, man. The hammer's bad. I'm walking this way, and the guy's walking that way, and it's Fred Williamson. And just as I'm passing, I'm like, oh, my God, that's the hammer. And so I just turn around, are you Fred Williamson? He goes, you got it. <laughs> need somebody to stand up and say, hey, when the smoke clears and the guns are all fired, we're the ones left standing. You know, don't kill me and go have him, Stallone, avenge my death. Kill Stallone. Let me avenge Stallone's death. Who's there? I came out to California just for a look around. I got an agent just like that. He said, Gloria. I want you to come over to this set with me. They're looking for an actress. It was Black Caesar. I walked in, they looked at me, and Fred was standing on the side, just observing. And Larry started talking to me. He said, look, and they were in the middle of shooting. He said, look, um, how do you feel about nudity? Well, first of all, I'm a bunny. So nudity to me was not a big deal. So I said, I have no problem with it, as long as it's done with taste. He said, well, the fe feature film calls for it. So um, I, I left, and next thing I knew, the following day, my agency said I got the part. Right, and I've had it. I've had it up to here. Yeah, right. They're I... pitching my ass. I understand. And they're thinking I'm a prostitute. I'll talk to them. Come on. Oh, baby, please. Come on. Come on. Just sit down, will you, and play a couple of tunes for me? I'm not asking much. Just sit down and play a couple of tunes. What do you want to hear? Doesn't matter, just make it loud. And then uh, James Brown was brought in. They sent me the, the music. And I don't know, James had done a wonderful thing, he thought, which was if the scene was three minutes long, James wrote seven minutes of music for it. If a scene was a minute and a half, James wrote three minutes of music for it. Uh, I said to Bobbitt, who was his assistant, I got a two-minute scene. He wrote four minutes of music. He says to me, well, the man gave you more than you need. I said, Charles, it doesn't work that way. The music has got to fit the scene. But a band can make it okay. Yeah! Picture opened. It was a blockbuster. Who the hell are you? Did you know that a man's beard keeps right on growing even after he's dead? And then once you get through that vicarious thrill of seeing a black man beat up a white man on the screen. You go back and you face the same evil system that you faced before you went there. And we should always deal with reality and not fantasy. I did not like that climate during that time. These organizations failed to understand that the community was really in need of their own heroes and black movies. NAACP and CORE, they're the ones who created this terminology, black exploitation. So that has to be clear on the record book. It came from them. It didn't come from the white press. It came from them. I didn't like the term, especially during that time. I went, what is that? How dare you pigeonhole us? Who was being exploited? All the black actors were getting paid. They had a job. They were going to work. The audience wasn't being exploited. They were getting to see things on their screen that they had longed for for over the years. So I don't really understand where this terminology fits. 
the NAACP never tried to go out and get enough money to make a movie that they wanted to see. You know, and that was always my beef. You know, if you have a problem with this particular film, then get some money and make the film you want us to see.